Today we're going to be looking at how to paint this classic metal iron breaker from 6th edition Warhammer Fantasy. Okay, base coats. First, we're using Vallejo steel metal colour, which is quite a dark um, steel base coat. And because this is the first and predominant colour on the mini, I use a really large brush. And it's a size 4 for this. And we don't need to be too specific at this point, or too neat really, with where we're putting things, because we can always come back and touch all of that up later on in one sweep before we do um, washes and everything else. So we just want nice thick coverage on this. It doesn't need to be in thin coats, it's not usually the way I paint. Just One layer will do everything we need it to. And you'll see several details here that I'm painting over with steel, like the heads and the belt down here, um, bits on the, the helmet itself, and the decoration on the axe head, which I will later um, touch up and, and redo in gold, but just for now it's much quicker to get this first layer down and then be precise with the raised elements. Next we're going to do the main area of the helmet itself, so between the banding and the runes, and we're going to be using Vallejo metal colour copper for this one. Again, you can still use quite a large brush for this, you don't always need to be doing things with these minuscule brushes that people end up painting things with, it just takes far too long and everything ends up drying on the brush. See, it's perfectly able to avoid overspilling on things if you're just careful with a large brush. It will save you a lot of time and hassle in the long run. And the final metallic base coats are gold. And for this, the Vallejo gold is, is really a very bright colour. Um, it's quite a strong yellow gold. Um, so. For the base coat, I prefer to use a mix of this and copper together, so I use a 50-50 ratio or thereabouts. I'm not fussy about ratios between things anyway, because in the real world things come in a huge range of hues anyway, so it doesn't matter if there is some variety in what you're doing. So you'll see this colour here is quite a nice, you can get a light on that quite a nice gold basis for what we're working on. So I'm just going to be doing all the runes here. Still using that whacking great brush that we started off with. The face on the axe head itself. More raised lettering on his shoulder guards. So catch this but just in between the strands of his beard. The faces around this back plate. There's another face here on the bottom of his axe. One on the back of his hand. So that's all of our metallic base coats down really quickly. Remaining base coats we're going to standard non-metallic colours. Citadel Dryad Bark. And we'll be using this for all of the leather material on the mini. The boots like this, finer plate around joints, so just underneath the legs here at the base of the glove. Interestingly on some minis in the studio army they do colour these black or leather and on other ones they leave the metallic almost at random within the unit, which is a little strange but I've decided to do all of them leather colour just so there's a bit more variety because there is really a lot of metal on these otherwise which gets a little bit samey. There's also his dagger here, or the sheath for it at least. Next we'll do the shaft of his axe which I'm going to paint in black using Citadel's Abaddon Black. 
so we're just going to be quite careful at this point. Next is the banding around the base of his skirt, which you can see here. This sometimes, again they paint in metallic in all the, the studio models, but I would like a bit more unity in the armour. So I'm going to keep those green, and this is the recipe that they use for the Karakurn green in the original 6th edition army book, which is to start off with, as it was then, Dark Angels green or now Caliban green. And then finally our beard. And I'm going to do an entire video about just beard colours and different ways of doing those, because I'm obsessed with painting beards. But for this one we're going to be using Bane Blade Brown as our base coat, which is a kind of lightish, beige, sandy brown sort of colour. I would, when painting the actual unit, be batch painting these. People differ in how many they feel comfortable batch painting at a time. With fantasy models, I feel it depends on how detailed they are. The older Warhammer sculpts like these ones aren't yet in GW's phase of adorning everyone with an entire cabinet of trinkets all over every inch of their body. So I don't mind painting these as I would historicals, which is roughly an entire battalion at a time. So for Napoleonics I tend to paint uh, 32 figures at a time in batches. And with these it'll be a whole unit at a time, so on my desk I have 20 iron breakers that I'm painting up as a batch as well. There is quite a lot which you're not really going to be able to see at this angle but just down here, well you can get that on camera, just down here underneath his beard where it meets his paunch. So that's all of our base coats. The very last step is just going to be touching up where I was slightly rough with some of the metallics earlier on and it will only be the first layer of steel that we'll need to worry about there. So keep a little bit, and I am going to a finer brush. This is a, a triple naught artist opus brush, which I use for most of my more detailed things. So places to look out for here are just this face guard on the helmet where it meets the flat surface, the banding down the sides, Actually isn't too bad to pick out on this one. This is another tip with painting large groups of units at a time, is to allow yourself some shortcuts earlier on and then to touch up where necessary later on, as it does overall save you quite a lot of time rather than going back and correcting something, then doing something else that's going to lead to a mistake, and then touching up and then painting it again, and constantly going back and forth, which I do find really slows the overall process down. There we go, and that's all of our base coats done. So next up will be washing. So I'm using Agrax for this, and this is essentially going to be a slower way of doing the old army painting method for historicals where you just dip everything in the same shade. Um, people tend to use a black wash for their armour, so null oil quite a lot. Um, I prefer the brown look, if I'm honest. So I find it just complements everything a bit better, and it adds that kind of grimy, earthiness. There will be another time for precision later on, but as with applying our base coats, we don't need to be fussy about this at this point. You will see it will still end up looking rather presentable. So our wash has dried and now we're going to start adding some more interest to the armour. So I'm going to begin by darkening certain areas of that and for this I'm using a glaze of Abaddon Black so I've mixed it with quite a lot of water. I'm just going to be pulling from the mid area down into the recesses. Main areas just to pick out here will be anywhere that is going to be a true shadow. 
so underneath things like the beard that we picked out earlier so between the fingers and anywhere you've got those sharp lines so I'll be back once I have finished adding these shadows the next step is where all the interest in the armor comes from and this one takes a little while but it's not too bad when you get into the process of it so we're going to start again with our base coat that we used for our armor which is Vallejo steel and something that's quite nice about these paints is just how thin they are where you can actually create a glaze with metals which normally you wouldn't be able to do something like Citadel's metal paints where they have these enormous flakes of pigment that you can see from across the room I'm exaggerating um, you can't do very much with those in the way of glazing they just they don't work at all whereas these ones are thin enough that you can and as always with this sort of thing you're pulling towards the lightest area or where you want the colour to end up um, so you start where you want it weakest so I'm starting in the darker area and then pulling up towards the highlight which for me is going to be about three quarters of the way up this plate is where the high point is going to be um, obviously everything here is under his beard so this will be shaded as well it's this sort of center point here where the light would be coming down on top of it that we want to highlight up to so for this um, bottom of his glove for instance we imagine the light coming down from this sort of angle up here we always want the same light source for everything we're painting so the high point is going to be about here so I'd want my mid-tone to end about here in the center so I'm going to pull from a dark area up towards that midpoint and from the highlight here and then this is where we'll bring in the lighter shades afterwards and our back plate again same thing going for about the middle here top will be in shadow from this bottom we're darker because that's where all the rainwater and grime and things would end up so that's going to be darker around here it's worth also deciding when you've got something with so much metal on it where exactly you want the contrast to come from so which textures you want to appear different to other ones because if you paint it all as if it's flat plate steel it is again going to get very boring across a unit so for me the chainmail is going to be darker there's more shapes there there's more for the light to get broken up on. so I'm not going to end up highlighting that anywhere near as much as I will the plate steel next we're going one step up so I'm going to use Vallejo dark aluminium for this one and this one again I want to thin it down into something of a glaze wipe off the excess on the tissue and we're going to go again from the midpoint so we're going to go part way where we joined the black and join the middle of the plate here the points to focus on here are obviously going to be from, for instance, we had our shadow, our midpoint, and then we're going to start our highlight about here. So we're going to pull from that area up towards the top. Remembering where our highlight is going to be. This part is slightly going to be shadowed from his hand, so I won't worry about that. And then anything that we want to pick out in a bit more detail, I'm just going to cover the entire surface with that at this point. So the fingers, for instance, these little plates down here would be nice to pick out. and all of the various rivets I'm just going to pick out with this colour as well. The one place we'll do a bit differently is going to be on the axe itself. Instead of glazing here I am just going to go straight in with this colour, leaving the dark areas just around where we painted that detail in gold. Final step with the main armour is going to be our edge highlights which will be our brightest point on all of this. For this I'm using by Echo Silver. And this one, instead of it being a glaze, it is really just going to be um, picking out the edges. So around here, where you have this sharp point at the bottom of the armor, is a nice one. I'm going to pick out the rivets also in this silver color. The areas you'll probably want to focus on the most with this is going to be the hands, which have lots and lots of surfaces on them. You want to think of all of these as being uh, 
almost uh, rectangular shapes, so you'll have quite a stark contrast between a face that is being illuminated and one that's in shadow. The axe head itself, obviously, is going to have a nice point, and you can just pull this down in a sort of feathering motion like this, um, just to add some interest. And of course, anything on the face will get our brightest highlights as well to draw attention to that part of the model. You can see these are almost sculpted as if they're eyebrows. With this kind of stripy sort of texture to them, so I'm going to imitate that in the way I'm painting the texture as well. And I will pick out the very ridge of all of these bands on his helmet as well. So there we have our completed steel on this. You can see there is quite a contrast between, hopefully here, the darkest areas down here in his belly, here, and the brightest point, which was around here again. So copper and gold, I'm going to be using a sepia ink next. And this is going on to copper and gold. So I'm going to pull just at the edge, being careful not to get it onto the highlight. I've just spent all that time painting with the steel. So I'm just going to pull it around the edges and picking out the edges of the lettering with it as well. Inks are something I've ended up using quite a lot in recent years. There used to be a, a lot of use with them um, instead of washes back in earlier GW paint ranges. And back when I started, it was what they would they would kind of give you in the store as the demonstration of how to make something instantly look better, kind of talent in a bottle, as they called it. You can use it also to modulate the colour of certain plates, so like I've done with the shadow here, um, where I'm painting cream on Death Guard, for instance, I used uh, three different Dolorani inks on my Typhus model I painted as a way just to darken those colours and get some shading and interest on that. I'm also going to use it because it flows a bit better than washes just to pick out all the detail in the lettering. So this is in addition to the Agrax wash that we've already applied. Picking out, for instance, in between the parts of this letter H down here and in the R and the B. Remember we've got all of this lettering up here. I'm just going to drop this over the top. There's quite a lot of detail on this almost feathered one here. The other thing that we can use inks for, especially with the sepia colour, is just as a drop around the rivets that we've already painted on the steel. Because again, that's where grime and things like that would accumulate over time. So it helps to make those pop. So I'm just going to drop it around each of the rivets that we've done on the steel as well. For highlights on these, I'm just going to go back to the mid-tones that I used on the base coats. So apply copper on the copper, water it down a bit so that it will act as a glaze mid-tone up to the highlight, so most of that will be around the top part of this. For the copper, this is as bright as we're going to go, I won't bother with any further successive highlights, um, because I don't want it to detract from the more interesting, brighter points that will be the runes on top of it. So that's that for the helmet, that's now finished, and here's our gold. And this one, rather than glazing or anything, because it's only lettering and details, I'm just going to go in straight on top so you'll see, for instance, this end, it looks a bit dull at the moment against all the other shading that we've had. But as soon as we catch that with the side of our brush, it will instantly pop a lot more. So for an example of that, if you look at the face on the axe head, this detail up here. We've darkened this down a lot because we used our original blend of gold with copper in it and then we put a wash on and then we applied inks um, and we caught it as well. We did black lining earlier on with the Abbott and Black. So I'm just going to focus on the areas which don't have any shading in them. So I'm going to pull up this ridge here, all the way around the edges of it.
Okay. And that should instantly pop quite a lot more than it did before. We've got all of this shadow. We haven't had to do anything complicated, just a wash ink and that's it. And the very last step is going to be mixing part of our silver into our gold. So I'm going to separate those out here. Probably about a 60-40 mix, or at least that's what I'm aiming for roughly, of gold to silver. And that will just be as an edge highlight on the parts we've picked out, so mostly on the really pronounced brow of this shape on the axe head and the nose and tongue and the lettering on the helmet. So just trying to catch only the top edge of those. So there we have it with all of our metals. Next will be our regular highlights. I'll start off with green. Um, again, going back to the recipe that was in the 6th edition army book for this. It's a 50-50 mix of oops, Caliban green and Warpstone glow that we're going to use as a highlight. I'm being quite um, generous here with where I'm highlighting. So most of it actually I want to raise up to this colour. Remember we had Caliban green, then we had our um, Agrax wash as well on top. So this is already gone down to text and where we started. You'll be able to see this better when we get to doing the shield at the end as well, which you'll see I've left off for everything so I can access all of the surfaces more easily. And we'll pick out the edge of the green as well, just in warpstone glow without any blend this time. So just really carefully catching the underside of the green and just along the top as well. Next set of highlights will be the leathers, which I'll be doing in Gorefall Brown. It's just going to be the size of the boots down here. And these little parts up here along the wrist as well. Last step is going to be doing his beard as well. So we started off with Bane Blade Brown, we added a wash onto it. We're going to highlight that up with first bane blade brown and then a shabti bane. Something that's nice to do with these as well is to have some variety in where um, we're changing the tone. So nearer to the face I'm going to leave it darker there and have it brighter as it reaches the ends just to create a little bit more interest as well. And then our shabti bone just going to pick out a few individual strands here. So for instance, on this part here. Another step we can add is black lining some areas. Um, it's optional. You don't really need to do this at all. Where I think you get the most mileage out of this is going to be on the beard. So having shaded everything and then brought our highlights again, we are losing a little bit of the definition. And some strands. So I'm just very, very carefully going to pick out some of the lines in between the beard strands again that we'd highlighted. Focusing a bit more nearer the face, we wanted that part to be darker anyway. Right, last bit is going to be reuniting our dwarf with his shield, which you see I've mounted on a biro stick, which as a teacher I have no shortage of. Um, I'm going to start off having primed this in black again um, with the back of the shield and we're just using our, our metal base coat that we used earlier on so that's Vallejo steel again in case you've forgotten cover this all over uh, a little bit roughly at this point catch the edge because I will inevitably overspill onto that when I'm doing the lettering you'll see that I'm actually keeping the brush relatively still and rotating the shield itself on the biro which is another reason I like mounting them like this there's no glue or anything it just so happens that the um, the node on his hand is a perfect thickness for a biro inner to just be wedged in there 
Um, rough, again, first step, doesn't matter so much. Next is going to be the gold. Um, so we use the same base that we did before of a mix of gold and copper. So we have our gold mix. I'm going to use this on top of the axe in the center. Now the tricky part is catching all of this sort of Celtic knot work sort of pattern around the banding of the shield, which uh, there isn't really a trick for. You just have to kind of hold your brush somewhat horizontally as you can and brush it across the top. If you have any of this kind of poking motion, you're going to go through it and it won't work. That's close enough for now. Um, next, we will do the center, which is going to be the exact same green that we'd used on the armor. So we'll start off with Caliban green. Being a little bit careful now not to go onto the gold that we painted before. All right, highlighting the green, uh, we've got our mix again of Caliban and Warpstone glow. And the idea here is because the shield is slightly angled um, in uh, away from the model like this, the light's actually going to be lighter towards the bottom of the shield rather than the top. So I'm using all of this here, um, Caliban green, exactly what was that dark green. And then I'm just going to pull around the outside a crescent that gets slightly fatter towards the bottom and then Slim, slims out again at the sides. So try and do this in a way that you can see it on camera. Um, I'll start just here at the very edge quite thinly. You can see that and then pull down to a thicker line. And I'm of course just applying slightly more brush pressure to get the hairs to flatten out a bit. So there's, whoops. Right, crisis averted, shield regained. Next, to make that brighter, we're just going to add increasing amounts of warp stone glow into our same mix we had before. So adding a bit more warp stone to it. And same thing again. Now pulling slightly further down towards the bottom of the shield. The usual adage of mass painting models for armies is that you spend your time on bases and faces. Um, in the case of dwarves, since there is so much true metallic metal, at least the way I paint them. Um, shields are your next biggest point of interest. Um, and given the kind of variety of sculpts there are in the range as well, where you have not really that much area to express a unifying theme, the shields are your best place to do that. So this is, along with bases and faces, I think the next most important place, with beards possibly. And the last steps with this are the same things you see me doing throughout this model, so I haven't recorded those again, but it's just for the gold, doing an ink wash, then highlighting back up on the raised areas, and for these uh, metal bands around the inner and the outer rim, just going over those in Playerho Silver. And our very final step will be mounting the shield onto the mini, so take it off our biro. Um, you'll see the inside has been kept relatively clean from that. Um, what I'm going to be using for this is a gel super glue, which is a Gorilla super glue gel, um, and a unfolded paper clip. Um, I'm going to carefully scratch off a bit of the paint on this. Then being very careful with the tip of our paper clip, we're going to take a little bit of our super glue gel to place on the inside of this indentation on the shield. Not too much because otherwise it will uh, escape around the edges of the hand when you put it on and ruin what you've done. And then we're just going to locate it onto the hand like so and apply gentle pressure to the other side of the figure. Make sure it's facing upright. So there we have our completed figure. My idea with this, although it's been a little bit rambling at times I realise, um, is to create a kind of resource which I can refer back to for subsequent units. So all of the techniques I've used with metal here are going to be similar for other units. 
Um, the only ones I can think of exceptions for might be something like the miners, where they'll be a bit more um, sooty, so I might use a darker wash for those ones. Um, but otherwise, this is a body of general techniques and approaches to painting that I'll be using across an entire army, um, obviously, so that they are similar and unified and hopefully satisfying as a complete project on the table. Thank you for watching.